All right, hey everybody, uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, it looks like we're still waiting for a good deal of people to kind of drift in, so while people are doing so, uh, I'm gonna give a brief, um, quick intro uh, describing uh, one of the new things that we have, this lecture page and uh, why we're doing it. Um, so previously, we have been uh, sharing all of these lectures on the community page, which let's pull up here, um, which was not very fun because if you wanted to get a hold of any of these lecture materials, you'd have to either scroll down if they're recent or search for them. Um, but you can see here, I still shared them in the community. Um, so this is the first notebook that we're gonna be talking about today, arbitrage pricing. Uh, but now, um, there's also uh, this quantopian.com slash lectures page, and there is a link to that on the community. And I'm just going to say off the bat, um, this computer appears to be having some issues today. Uh, it feels slow, so I apologize if at any point things are slow. Um, I'm going to work on fixing that going forward. But to get to the lectures page, you can go to the direct link. If you Google search Quantopian lectures, that'll take you there. There's also a link from the uh, forums here. Um, so any of those any of those places will take you to the lectures page. Um, and uh, this is the lectures page. And the lectures page is basically hosting all of our uh, lecture materials that we've developed. So these are lectures that you may have tuned in for in the past for the webinars or maybe even have attended in person. Um, we're going to be doing some lectures in New York coming up this fall. So if you're in the New York area, definitely check our meetup page. That's NYC algorithmic trading on meetup.com. Uh, but yeah, so you can see there's all sorts of different uh, notebooks here. Um, you can get back tests, uh, which are algorithms that, uh, you know, demonstrate the principles um, that we talk about in this lecture. Uh, I think that this stuff is super important, especially stuff like, um, where is it? Uh, overfitting, that's hugely important. Uh, instability of estimates, also really important because these are things that people just don't normally think about. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about arbitrage pricing theory, uh, factor risk exposure, and fundamental factor models. And these, this today, the, the webinar will, as some of you know, become the videos that you see when you go to watch video. So you're getting this firsthand. Um, all right, so uh, I'll go ahead and get started. We're going to go through in the order of arbitrage pricing theory, fundamental factor models, and factor risk exposure. And if anybody has questions at any point, um, please just ask them. And what I'll do is I'll take periodic pauses to answer questions. And uh, I will also be pausing between notebooks because what we're doing now is we're going back through and we're splitting up this broadcast into smaller chunks so that when you click watch video here, it actually goes to a chunk uh, rather than a you know, full hour long video that has a lot of stuff you probably don't care about. So again, ask questions, I'll get to them. And uh, please forgive my few seconds of pausing between notebooks. So I'll go ahead and show you guys what it looks like when you're on the lectures page and you and you get a notebook here. The same as if you clone it from the forums. Um, so let's start and we'll look at the arbitrage pricing theory lecture. And again, I apologize, this computer is a little slow today, which is gonna be slightly annoying. Um, but again, we'll try to fix that as soon as possible. So as soon as this guy loads, here we go. We're gonna talk about arbitrage pricing theory. Uh, arbitrage pricing theory is based on these factor models. And so the first thing I'll do is say, well, what's a factor model? This is a linear factor model, okay? Now, it comes from the fact that these are factors, commonly denoted as F sub one, F sub two, and it is a linear combination that is modeling the returns of some asset. So R sub I is a return stream, and you're saying, can I predict for returns uh, using these factors? Another way to phrase it is um, what percentage of my returns, what portion of my returns comes from each of these factors? 
right? Because you can think about returns as coming from different places. So you might have an algorithm that has, gets a lot of its returns from the market, and that's not necessarily great. You might have an algorithm that gets a lot of its returns from small cap stocks. I mean, maybe that's okay. Again, it all depends on your risk tolerances, uh, what you know, type of strategy you're trying to achieve. So, and then the final way to think about it is how exposed am I to these factors, right? So there's the kind of three different modes of thinking here. You're saying, can I use these factors to predict my returns? What percentage of my returns are coming from these factors? And how exposed am I to, the, uh, am I to these factors? They're all very important. And we're gonna talk about all three of those modes of thinking today. So arbitrage pricing theory uh, basically says that um, assets should be correctly priced based on the expected returns and the risk that you're taking on. Now, factors are a good expression of risk, as we'll talk about more in the um, risk analysis portion of the lecture. But the reason for that is because if you have a lot of your returns coming from one factor, your returns are very dependent on that factor. And that factor going down or up, as it may be whether you're shorted or along that factor, uh, can negatively impact you a lot. So you would say that there is, you're taking out risk on that factor when, you're, when, you're, when your return streams come from that factor. So um, what arbitrage pricing theory says is it says that basically this formula will always hold. This formula of the expected returns is equal to the risk-free rate. And again, in case you don't remember, the risk-free rate is um, basically this the perfectly safe way to invest your money. And for most people use US Treasury bonds to do this. They don't give very much returns, but they're guaranteed. They're not gonna default on you. They're not gonna go down. So that's the risk-free rate. And you're saying in, in order, like the risk-free rate is the perfectly safe way. And to get any returns over the risk-free rate, you have to take on some risk. And this is kind of a fundamental theory in finance is that there's kind of no free lunch, right? And in a perfectly efficient market, um, you would not be able to get more returns without taking on more risk. Because, and and the, expected, the expected value after a certain amount of time would be the same for any asset because if there was an asset that could get more returns than the risk it took on, um, that asset would be immediately bought down to the point where it was no longer like it, it got too expensive basically so arbitrage says that whenever something is mispriced whenever something is more profitable than the risk it takes on or whenever something is too not as profitable as the risk it takes on um that asset will be arbitraged back down to this fair uh rate so what does that mean well that's all well and good uh, if you know the expected returns of an asset. But of course, knowing the expected returns is incredibly difficult and more or less impossible. So what this is telling you is it's saying, if I know this thing, which is impossible to know, then I can say all this fancy stuff, right? But you don't know that thing. So what do you do? Well, the interesting thing is you can go the other direction. You can say, Let's say I don't know expected returns, but I theorize that the markets are obeying this, uh, this arbitrage rule, that prices are gonna be arbitraged out. Okay, well, what that means is, if you know the risk-free rate and you know all of these factors, which you do, then you can predict for expected returns, right? So this is super valuable because it means that it gives you a way to predict for returns based on these factors. And what this leads to is um, basically these long short equity strategies. And we're gonna do a full lecture on long short equity strategies, so I'm not going to, going to go into it a huge amount here. But the general idea is that for every asset that you have on the stock market, like every, every one of like the approximately 10,000 assets, you equities rather, sorry, you um, price the equity based on these factors. And these factors can be whatever. They can be the FAMA French factors, which I'll talk about a little later. They can be some factors that you've developed, which is kind of the interesting case. Um, oftentimes, you'll probably want to use fundamental factors for this. And I'll talk about fundamental factor modeling um, a little later. 
But the general idea is that you predict for the expected returns given these factors, and then you rank everything by those expected returns. And what you're betting on is not betting on being able to perfectly predict returns for any one given asset. You're betting on the fact that in that ranking, the uh, assets, the equities near the top of the ranking will have higher returns than the assets near the bottom of that ranking. And the reason that that works out is because um, let's say that you have assets at the top tending to make 5% more per year than the market and assets at the bottom tending to make 5% less. Okay, great. You've, you've differentiated your, your assets. This ranking system you've developed is predictive. And we've talked about how to check the predictivity of a ranking system in the Spearman uh, rank correlation lecture. Uh, so I recommend you go check that out if you're considering developing a long short equity strategy, which you should do. Um, but it, it boils down to this formula, which is at the top basket, let's say you long the top ones that you think will make more. And then that the returns you can expect from those are market plus 5%. And then you short the bottom basket, like 10%. And then, sorry, you short like, you know, the bottom, let's say a thousand stocks, long the bottom, long the top a thousand stocks. You short the bottom a thousand stocks. And that means that the returns you're going to get on that is market minus 5%, but it's negative because you've shorted it. Markets cancel out. So you get market neutrality and you should get a consistent 10%. So you're making a pure bet on the quality of your factor model using a long short equity strategy. And you don't get dependent on the market, you become market neutral. Um, I think they're really great strategies and they allow you to focus on modeling the market using fundamental factors, uh, which in my opinion is one of the best ways to model the market because fundamental factors are like real things that are going on at companies, right? If I tell you, hey, um, a company has a lot of cash and not very much debt. On average, that company is probably going to do better than a company that has a lot of debt and not very much cash. That's kind of like a, you know, very accessible, tangible statement. It's not vulnerable to a lot of bias. And so modeling the markets in those ways um, tend to be much more reliable than doing something, you know, crazy with maybe a single instrument strategy or trying to machine learn price curves or something like that. So we're going to show an example of this, as we always do. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to compute expected returns for two assets. And in this case, the factors we're going to use are going to be the market, SPY, uh, and the market returns, rather. Sorry, we're getting, using the SPY ETF as a proxy for market returns. And then the, the risk-free rate, we're going to use this ETF as a proxy for that. It's not perfect, but it's fine for a teaching example. Um, so what we're going to do is just create our data set, and then we'll run our regression. And we'll say, give me the coefficients in this factor model, modeling the asset returns as a linear combination of market returns and the risk-free rate returns. Okay? So these are the coefficients you get. You say for the first asset, which is this HSC guy, I have no idea what that is. Um, for the first asset, you say uh, p-value on that asset, less than 0 0.05. Great, so we actually can trust these coefficients. They seem to be predictive. And the market, beta, beta to the market, which is the beta that you always hear people talking about. You say strategies beta is 0.7, strategies beta is 1.5. They mean beta to the market, unless they specify otherwise. It's just slang. But of course, there's a beta to everything, as you see in this factor model. So the beta to the market um, is 1.76. What does that mean? Well, it means we're leveraged on the market. It means when the market goes up, we go up 1.7 times as much. When the market goes down, we go down 1.7 times as much with this security, more volatile than the market. And then the risk-free rate, we actually have a huge beta to the risk-free rate. We have a negative, negative 8.5. Why is that? Well, the risk-free rate is a lot smaller than the market. So this model has to, like the market returns, the returns on the risk-free rate are tiny. So this model has to put a massive coefficient on them to normalize them up. Um, maybe it would make sense in this case to uh, make a z-score out of these returns rather than just taking the raw returns because you can lead to like weird things in your model like this where one coefficient will just be way bigger than another. Um, so definitely normalizing your factors, and we'll, we'll talk about that in, in the next notebook, is, is useful. Uh, but if you don't, you can get to some weird situations like this. Now, some of you might know what's coming next here, which is we've just done a static regression on the time period of, uh, what is it here? It looks like, looks like a, a decent time period. Um, 
about a year. So we've just done a static regression on about a year. And the, oh, the other thing I'm going to point out here is that this isn't a perfect way to do it, but it's fine, again, for a teaching example. The way that we're making this model predictive is we're looking for returns a month in the future. Okay, so we've offset the prices, we've offset the returns of the assets and not of the um, factors. So we're saying, do the factors predict for returns a month one ahead rather than do the factors predict for returns today? And this is not technically correct because the returns on the day a month ahead are not um, just that day's returns. They're the cumulative returns over those 30 days. So if you wanted to actually you know, make a predictive model, you'd want to change this a little bit. Um, but it's, it, gets, it gets fairly complicated quickly in terms of the math. Not fairly complicated. I don't want to scare anybody away. But like, it gets complicated enough that I didn't want to do it for this teaching example. So what we're asking here is, do the returns precisely 30 days in the future, um, are they predicted for by these two factors today? So uh, as you can see, this model would say that they are, because the p-values are under 0 0.05 for both of them. And um, But of course, like I always say, you cannot just look at these, one, these single values. You just cannot take enough information out of one regression run on all your data. You need to look at different parts of your data. What happens if you run the regression over time? Because time moves, right? So like we were running the regression, let's say on this date, but you know, a month from now, we're running it on this date and we're gonna get different answers. And we wanna know, is my answer gonna be predictive? Because that's the question that you're really asking. You're saying, okay, in the past, these factors have been predictive of the month forward returns on the asset, but will that behavior hold true, right? Are the, are the factored values today predictive of returns a month from today, which we don't know yet, right? And to answer that question, you have to look at how consistent your model is being. Well, you can see here that, and again, probably for the reason that I mentioned that the risk-free rate returns are tiny, this thing is crazy inconsistent. The beta to the risk-free rate is just going all over the place. And look, if you just this is the static value from the regression of negative eight around negative eight. And if you had just done that one regression, you would have ignored all of this crazy stuff that's happening in here, right? So, like, you you can't just do a single regression. You need to look at what happens over time. And as you can see in this model, you'd say like, uh, maybe I don't want to use this model to predict for my returns because this is pretty inconsistent. And this is fine because, again, we're predicting for the returns of one asset. This is actually not going to give us very interesting results because single assets tend to be pretty arbitraged. So no one asset is like some crazy, you know, returns product that you can do crazy stuff with, right? Because if it were, it's a freely traded asset. Anybody can efficiently buy it out. If an asset is suddenly getting better returns in the market, it has positive alpha, it'll immediately get arbitraged down. Right? The reason that active managers can avoid that is because their product is not freely traded on the market. Right? If a hedge fund, if everybody thought that hedge fund was getting great returns, everybody would buy into that hedge fund, dilute the returns, and then all of a sudden that hedge fund wouldn't be getting great returns anymore. Um, but the reason that they can get away with that is because they're private and they take money on a discretionary basis. So again, these assets basically just are not consistently predicted for by this model, even though the p-value says that they are. Um, and the reason for that is because the p-value is assuming some stationarity in the data. It's assuming that the conditions are not changing over time. And so we talked about this a lot uh, in our violation of, of regression model assumptions and our model misspecification lectures. I recommend that you check those out because they they describe like a ton of cases like this in the real world where your models can look predictive but actually not be predictive. So it's just things to watch out for. So and then and then the other thing about this model is that let's say okay, well this green line is very not is not good at all, but this blue line doesn't look bad, right? It's it's sticking pretty close to that that value that we predicted. So let's zoom in on it. And of course the blue line has a ton of different, you know, motion as well when you adjust the scale. Now, of course, this is a question of scaling. And, and, and in fact, even this inconsistency may be fine. And the question you have to ask yourself is saying, OK, is my strategy OK if my beta to the market is 0 0.9? Is my strategy OK if my beta to the market is 1.5?
And is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is two? Because there's definitely going to be some more motion in addition to this. You're just taking a small sample. The, it could it could vary a lot more. You know, is my strategy okay if my if my is my strategy okay if my beta to the market is between zero and two? And you might say yes, that's fine. That doesn't affect my strategy, right? In which case, great. This is this is within your bounds. The inconsistency is not going to hurt your strategy. Go forward. But the important thing to do is just be aware of all the inconsistency. Be aware of the standard error and the parameters. Um, also, the other thing you should do is, again, check to see if the dis distribution of betas is normally distributed. And I'll talk about that a little later. But the, the one thing that people do is they try to put a standard error on these betas. But if these betas are not normally distributed, the standard error and the confidence interval will actually be wrong because it assumes normal distribution. So it's a, uh, you know, it, it can it, there can be a lot of problems here, um, but at the very least, checking for these consistency plots is is very very useful. It tells you a lot about the data, and there's a lot of tools to do rolling com computations in pandas and uh, stats models. So okay, assuming that these models weren't terrible as we just saw, um, let's try to predict the future using these models. Okay, so what we're going to do is just going to do the same computation. We're going to run the regression, get our coefficients, and then we're going to say, OK, well, we know what happened over August because we're near the end of August. So going 30 days forward, we should be able to predict what happens during September using this model. So that's what we do here. And you can see we make some predictions. Here's the stuff that we know happened with the returns of the asset. And then here's the predictions that we have for the returns of the asset. And this is based on what happened to the market and the risk-free rate um, in September. And so, of course, you can see that this is the market returns now are driving this massive spike down. Um, and uh, this, I think this is just an interesting, uh, I think this is just an interesting example because it shows like, okay, well, this is actually, you know, your model is trying to predict the future here. And ultimately in finance, you're always trying to predict the future. Um, and an important note that I'll leave you with for this notebook is I wouldn't trust any model to be able to predict the prices for a given security, for a given asset. That's incredibly monumentally difficult. And a lot of people try to do things like machine learn price curves and look for you know, indicators and stuff. And they'll say, well, this asset is going to be this price tomorrow, so I should buy or something. It, honestly, like I just don't trust that unless you're doing something that like is just completely genius, uh, or taking advantage of something that's completely not known today, um, that that you you were able to do that. And the reason that like long short equity strategies are good is because they accept the fact that they cannot predict the price accurately for any given equity uh, over the next time period. What they can do, however, is pick up on broad trends, right? So with a long short equity strategy, you're saying I'm going to make a prediction for a thousand assets. Well, I'm going to make a prediction for 10,000 assets, right? And then I'm going to use the prediction for 2,000 of them if I put 1,000 long and 1,000 short. And the reason that that works is because let's say that your model is a you know 51% success rate, right? And and finance is really a game of 51% success rates. If I get, took you to a casino and I said, hey, you have a 51% success rate uh, at all of these slot machines, what would you do? You wouldn't put all your money into one slot machine. You'd pick, you know, you'd, you'd put one n, one over n of your money into all of the n slot machines, right? You reduce your volatility as much as possible. And what that does is it makes you consistent money with good likelihood um, versus putting all of your money into one slot machine, which will lose all of your money with a 49% chance. So this is the same way with strategies, right? You're saying you don't really want to be super dependent on a single instrument and having to predict for the motion of that single instrument. But if you're predicting for a thousand instruments and you get it right 51% of the time, you're going to get that few percentage points edge where the returns in your long basket are slightly edging out the returns in your short basket. And you're going to be market neutral and you're going to be betting on that spread and you're just going to be better off. So it's just something to think about when building strategies that you want to accept the fact that you can't do some things, right? You're, you're, you want to accept what you can't do, use statistics to tell you what you can't do, and then say, okay, now that I know what I can't do, how do I like design a strategy around that? So that's kind of one of the big takeaway lectures from this. Um, but hopefully this should give you kind of a, an overview of factor modeling and, and what you can what you can use it for. 
Um, so the other notebook that I'm going to go to, and uh, again, I am trying to draw attention to Quantopian slash lectures. So www.quantopian.com slash lectures, or you can link to it from the um, community here. So just again, if anybody is seeing this now who was not here earlier, all of the lectures are available here. Um, you can get all the notebooks, the back tests, watch these videos, uh, and uh, find out, uh, you know, all, all of this stuff um, that we're teaching. We're also, and this is super early stage, but there's some consideration of whether, you know, we would want to make a course out of this. Um, so if anybody has interest in uh, doing a course uh, based on these lecture series, possibly with a, a certification uh, in the end where you could get certified, um, and, and I don't know exactly in what yet, we'd have to figure that out, but there's, we're throwing that, we're kind of throwing the idea back and forth. Um, if people are interested in that, please let me know, because the more interest we get in that idea, the more resources we can put towards it. So I'm going to pause for two seconds just so we can edit. And uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is fundamental factor models. And then the last thing we'll talk about is uh, factor risk exposure. So fundamental factor models. Um, oh, sorry, I see a question here. And um, OK, great. Interest in certification, interest in the course. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, we're definitely thinking about how we might do that. Um, it's something we're going to be throwing around. I would say stay tuned. If we do some, if we do release some information, we'll put it on the slash lectures page. So as long as you're just checking the slash lectures page every now and then or when the lectures come out, uh, you should stay up to date on anything we do. So, okay. We're going to talk about uh, fundamental factor models. And this might take, again, 10 seconds while the computer decides whether or not it wants to load this notebook. Um, let's see here. All right. Yeah, I definitely have to fix this for next time. OK, so fundamental factor models. Again, factor models are a linear combination of factors, and they're used to model the returns of an asset. The asset could be your algorithm, right? The thing that is important here is this return stream can be anything. And people often ask, well, how do you how do you decide whether or not our, our algorithms are good for the fund or the contest without looking at our algorithm? Well, all of this only requires a return stream. Um, and so you can do a tremendous amount of interesting stuff looking at exposures. You can look at what sectors you're exposed to using factor modeling like this, right? You can say, my factors are the returns of each sector. And so you can figure out, like, is a strategy heavily invested in one sector and not another. You can do a tremendous amount of stuff. That's not all we do, but it's it's definitely a part of what we do. Um, so it's very useful. And remember, you in research can get the return stream of your algorithm by importing backtest, the get backtest function. And uh, PyFolio, which was recently released on the forums, is basically has a ton of tools to allow you to do this. Um, also, the tear sheet does this, the algo tear sheet, which is also available on the forums. And it has a ton of tools to uh, allow you to analyze your return streams on your algorithm um, and figure out like, you know, whether they're good, they're bad, are they exposed to this, exposed to that, when do they do poorly, et cetera. So um, let's say that we want to model something using fundamental factors, OK? So rather than like the returns on the market and the returns on uh, the risk-free rate, we want to model using like uh, let's see, uh, book to price ratio and market cap, which are the two FAMA French fundamental factors. Well, the way that you do that is you uh, construct a portfolio uh, on the market using those factors. So you rank all the assets on the market by the factor, and then you do the long short thing where you long the top percent, short the bottom 30 per the bottom percent. And FAMA French, I think it's 30 top, 30 bottom. And you say, what returns would I get on this portfolio? And then those are the returns of that factor, right? 
So the reason for this is because it becomes market neutral. You're canceling out the market returns. You're just looking at the factors returns. And it allows you to look at a return stream based on a factor. So a good way to do factor modeling is rather than like put the raw value of the factor into the model itself, which you can do, again, you can just normalize it uh, using a z-score. Again, the z-score is current value minus mean value over standard deviation. Um, so you could normalize it or you could construct these por portfolios. And constructing the portfolios is kind of the given way to do it in academia right now. So the Fama French factors are um, market returns minus risk-free rate is one factor. And then the next one is returns on a market cap based portfolio. And then the next one is returns on a book to price, uh, book value yield portfolio. So we'll construct those two portfolios here. And you can see the first one is factor is just um, those that are at the top, those that are at the bottom, those that are at the top minus those that are at the bottom. And you get the returns and then you can start saying, okay, how is any return stream exposed to these factors? So, for instance, we'll look at um, the AA asset, um, Al Alcoa, and uh, our third factor is just going to be the bench returns minus the risk-free rate, the treasury returns, which again, we'll use the SPY and the bill ETFs as proxies. So, let's do the linear regression, and you can see, um, historically, over the last time period, we ran the regression. Uh, Alcoa is exposed, the beta to the market cap is 0.62, and the beta to the book-to-price factor is 0.5. So this is interesting, right? Because it allows you to start saying, where are the returns on my asset coming from? Where are the returns on my return stream coming from, right? And um, then the other thing you can do is, again, a rolling analysis to see how the exposures change over time. Because again, if you're saying, historically, the exposures have been this, that's fine. But what you're really interested in is like, what will the exposures be tomorrow, right? Because you can say, historically, my algorithm has been exposed high to small cap stocks and not very exposed to large cap stocks. But is that going to hold true tomorrow, right? And, and so the only way to know whether it would hold true tomorrow is, is you have to look at the consistency. Because if you're making a prediction based on data that's very inconsistent, that prediction is unlikely to be good. Um, so... Uh, this is what the exposures over time look like to the three Fama French factors. And this is all manually computed in the notebook, um, just to give you an idea of like the flexibility here. Uh, and so you can see like, is this, is this reasonable? Are you okay with these exposures? Maybe you are, maybe you aren't. The important point is just to, you know, know what the exposures are and be aware of how they change over time. Because this is interesting that it used to be exposed to F3, which was, um, F3 is the market. So the, it had a high exposure to the market, and then it stopped having a high exposure to the market. Well, actually, it went down to about 1. So it used to have an exposure of 1.5, which means it was about 1.5 times the market in terms of volatility, uh, and then it reduced. And like, why did that happen? Why did it go up down from a 1.5 beta to a 1 beta stock? I don't know, but it's an interesting observation that you can make looking at these exposures over time. Um, and then the other way to do factor modeling is, like I said, using a z-score. Uh, so, again, you can, use, you can put in anything here, and it will be normalized to a z-score, which deviates from zero depending on whether it's especially high or low, right? Um, now, the important thing is that you can't assume that it's normally distributed. Some people might assume that it's normally distributed and that 99% of the values will lie between negative 3 and 3 once you normalize to a z-score. That's only true if your underlying factor is also normally distributed. So uh, I'll show in the risk exposure notebook, in case you guys don't remember, shark bear test, it tells you if something is normally distributed, and then you can decide whether or not, um, assuming that it will be between negative three and three with 99% probability is reasonable. But either way, that doesn't affect the fact that you can normalize anything. Um, and then, uh, you don't, even if it's not normal, that's fine. You just can't assume things about how often it will be between certain, certain values. So again, what we'll do here is we will um, do the, basically the same analysis. I'm not going to go into it too much, but the same analysis, but just doing a, a normalized, using these, this factor of normalization. And again, the important thing here is that the idea is that you can use these factor models to create these ranking systems 
for long short equity strategies. Um, and this is, again, the idea would be that you develop a better factor model, better factors, maybe slightly more efficient, swap it in for the current factor model in a long short equity strategy. You don't have to do anything else. Like the rest of the strategy is there. You don't have to worry about like execution or like tricky things. It's, it's a fairly easy strategy once you have the, the ranking system. And the ranking system is where all the magic happens. And again, um, you can uh, evaluate the quality of a ranking system uh, using Spearman rank correlation. And we talk about that in the Spearman rank correlation lecture, which is on the lectures page. So that's the idea of using fundamental factors. And again, once you get the idea of factor modeling, this is literally just swapping in a fundamental value for one of these factors. Fama French is a really common one, um, but you can put in anything you want. Again, we have all of those, those fundamental data go crazy, create new factors, right? Like people do that all the time. They create new factors based on things that they think are interesting. And we're going to release a factor modeling API uh, in the, I, I don't want to give an exact date, but we're working on it right now. So um, definitely, I think as soon as we release that, I'm going to be very excited to show you some examples of running algorithms that use factor modeling. Uh, and we'll try to we'll we'll try to get that out for you as soon as possible. Uh, I think it will make this stuff a lot more interesting. Um, okay, so again, final notebook. I'm going to go to the community. Um, if this computer, there we go. Go to lectures, and the final notebook is going to be on risk exposure. So if anybody has any questions before we go to the final notebook. Um, I can answer them. I will wait maybe a few seconds. Um, I'll give, wait two seconds for editing to happen, and then I'll jump into the final notebook. If somebody has a question, uh, again, uh, I can answer it after I'm done with the final notebook. Okay, so risk exposure. Actually, we probably have like two minutes while it loads the notebook. but. Risk exposure is really important because it's kind of the final piece of the factor modeling puzzle. And it's saying, well, rather than trying to predict for future returns, why don't I worry about where my returns are coming from? So you'll notice, for instance, in the contest that we say that you cannot have a beta above a magnitude of 0.3 to the market. OK, that's just a condition we enforce. Why do we enforce it? Well, we say we don't want a lot of your returns coming from just what the market does, because that's not very interesting and you're super dependent on the market. And I think that last there is no better example than last week as to why you do not want to be dependent on the market. So people who had high betas to the market got hammered last week. They just got destroyed. But people who had low betas to the market, they just chugged along. They're making money, right? And you want your algorithm to have a beta of zero to every factor you can think of. You know, you put in a factor of um, the market, small cap stocks, large cap stocks, all the sectors, uh, price of oil, uh, temperature in Japan. You can put in all these factors and none of them can predict for the returns of your algorithm. All of your algorithm returns are in alpha. That's perfect, right? And so in factor modeling, um, you actually want to try to see how many factors it's still not dependent on. So you can put in like 100 factors in there. And if your betas are all still estimated to be like zero, that's great. That's really good. Uh, because that means that your algorithm is just not, it, it just ignores what happens in the world and it will make you money, right? And that's what you want. You don't want an algorithm that has a lot of its returns, a lot of, its ex a lot of exposure to one of these factors, which is the opposite of what's happening when you, when you um, want to try to predict. When you want to try to predict, you want to have as few factors as possible in your model because having more factors means you're just going to be overfit to historical data, right? So like if you have like two or three factors that can explain 40% of what happens in the price movements, that's great. That's great. You can put that into your ranking system. The, uh, you know, that's your, that's your 60% predictive capacity or whatever it is. You know, you, you put that in your ranking system and the, all the errors will cancel out. You'll make a ton of money. Um, but if you have like 10 factors that can predict 80% of a stock's price movement, uh, I'm betting that of those 10 factors, a, a good deal are just like purely based on noise in your historical returns. And that as you go forward, 
you're just going to actually like be not predictive at all because you're putting too much faith in these factors that were noise noise based. So um, you can you can be a little less worried about that with risk exposure when looking at historical exposure. You know you can put in a ton of factors and then if you discover a high exposure to one of them, you can be like, oh, this is interesting. Let me go investigate that. Of course, when predicting for future risk exposure and hedging, you still want to worry about overfitting because if again. Uh, this disclaimer here, all of the risk exposures are based on historical exposure. And that's no guarantee that the future exposure will be the same way. So for instance, if you compute that your, your, your historical exposure to the market has been uh, a beta of 0.6, and so you take 60% uh, of the dollars you have invested in the strategy and take out a hedge of that amount on the market, go short that amount, then like, okay, if your algorithm continues to be exposed 60% to the market, your algorithm will now be perfectly hedged against the market. But that's rarely the case. There's, again, often a lot of inconsistency in this number. And in that particular case, unlike in a long short equity strategy where you're accepting the fact that you can't predict any one value well, and you're you know, predicting for many, 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 and then hoping that you'll make money consistently on average, uh, in this case, you are actually trying to predict for one number well. And that number is your exposure to a factor, right? So it's a little trickier when you're doing um, hedging math as you know you really do have to worry about uh, consistency of past exposures, how overfit you might be. Because if you get it wrong, like you're you're just you're actually adding exposure to that factor. It's negative exposure, but you're adding exposure to that factor. Um, and you don't want to be doing that. So we're going to be looking at this formula here called FM CAR, which stands for Factor Marginal Contribution to Active Risk. And um, what this does is active risk is the risk that you take on by being an active manager or that your algorithm takes on by being an active portfolio manager. Well, what does that mean? It means that if you take your, retur your, your returns minus the benchmark returns, the market returns, those are the active returns. Okay? So... Um, Active returns uh, have a standard deviation, and if you take that standard deviation, that's the risk that you take on by being an active manager, right? Some of that risk, if in your some of the risk in your returns, your raw returns are com is coming from the market, uh, you know. But you you want to know what risk am I taking on in my active management? And so you, the way you do that is you say my returns minus the market returns are the active returns. The standard deviation of that is um, the active risk. So this formula uses active risk. And the other thing it does is it looks at the covariance or correlation. Uh, again, there's in the correlation lecture, you'll see that they're very closely related. They're not exact, but you get, you know, they have carry the same concept. Um, and they look at the covariance of the two factors. And it basically incorporates knowledge of the covariance into um, the risks that you take on when being exposed to that factor. Because Let's say that you're exposed to one factor. Let's say that two factors are highly uh, correlated. They move together a lot. Being exposed to one is going to mean that you're automatically exposed to another. Also, it's going to make the linear regression model freak out a little bit because if two factors expo exp like explain the same stuff in your model, uh, your model can actually choose any combination of uh, parameters for that. And we talked about that, I believe, in the... Um, instability of regression parameters lecture. And basically what you can show is that if you have two very highly correlated uh, independent variables, those independent variables can get whatever betas you want. You can make it be 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0.5, 0, 0.5. It'll all be the same because, you know, they, they basically, because they're so highly correlated, you can treat them as the same variable. So 0.5x plus 0.5x is equal to 1x plus 0x, if that makes sense, right? Because, you, you know, for, for the intents of your model, you treat them as the same variable because they move, they move in the same way, they explain the same thing. So what this is doing is it's, it's incorporating knowledge of that into this risk metric. And I'm not going to go into it much more than that. Uh, but the general idea is that if you run this formula, you can determine what percentage of the risk that you're taking on uh, is coming from each factor. So again, we're going to generate the FAMA French factors. This is the same code from the last notebook. Um, and then we're going to look at user regression, look at historical sensitivities of, uh, I believe in this case, it is the HSC asset. 
And um, so what you can see here is the historical sensitivity over the time period is 0 0.01 to the market, which is good because in this case, this is only active returns we're looking at. Historically, we were looking at the asset returns raw. Now we're just looking at asset uh, active returns. So the asset returns minus the benchmark returns, right? So interestingly, it, once we look at active returns, what the, what the asset is doing on top of the market, the exposure to the market cap becomes low. That's an interesting, you know, that's interesting. The exposure to book to price becomes high. So what this is telling you is it's saying the stuff that's going on at HSC, whatever they're doing there at that, at that company, the stuff that's going on at HSC is highly dependent on book to price. Right, that fundamental factor is guiding a lot of the returns. Market cap is 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 not okay. So that's just an interesting an interesting observation you can make. Um, and again, now now that we have all these uh, all this data, we can compute the FM car metric for each. And so you can see that the market cap risk contribution is very low, and the book to price risk contribution is about seven percent. So what it's saying is it's saying. Um, the amount of, of all the risk that I take on uh, by buying this asset, 7% comes from the movement and the book to price factor, that fundamental factor. So this is just a very informative statement you can make about your algorithm. You can run this on your algorithm return stream rather than making it on this asset. You can literally, you in this cell, you could just swap in, do get back test and swap in your algorithm return stream instead of the asset, and you could run exactly the same analysis. I should probably release a notebook showing you how to do that, but um, PyFolio actually has all of this built in. Um, so as soon as that's ready to go, I forget if it's currently out or in the process of being rolled out, but this will basically let you be able to do all this stuff. Um, I'm not sure if it has FM car, but it, at the very least, you'll have this notebook so you can, again, like I said, just swap in your asset for, you know, your algorithm for the asset, and then you can see what your algorithm is doing in terms of exposures. Um, but again, like I always say, you cannot trust a single regression. You need to look at what happens over time. And so let's look at what happens over time here. Um, look at how the beta exposures change. Um, so the beta exposures you can see here, uh, they move around, right? How much do they move around? Well, they move around a decent amount. I don't know. Again, it, de it depends on what your strategy's tolerances are, but they definitely move. And so what you can see here is you can see, okay, well, let's comp make this function. This function will compute FM car. Um, and uh, let's compute it over time. And so you can see for both factors, what's the FM car? What's the factor risk? Okay. And so you can see that this F factor two, which is the book to price factor, has these huge spikes, right? For this period of time, a tremendous amount of the risk in this asset's return stream was coming from the book to price factor. And the, for this period of time, the same is true. Not so for this period of time, not so for this period of time, what's going on here, right? Um, and I got a question, I'll answer the question as soon as I'm done with this notebook, I'm almost done here. Uh, but so what's going on here? Well, you might say, okay, so, are you comfortable saying that your this asset's exposure to this factor is 7%? I'm not, because look at this distribution. It's not a consistent 7%. It's crazy spiky, right? So you say, okay, well, let's put a confidence interval around that number. Let's say that it, look at, look at the standard deviation of this data, and let's say that it's 7% plus or minus whatever that number is, okay? And I'm, not, I'm also not comfortable doing that because standard deviation depends on the assumption that the underlying data is normally distributed. And we don't know that. And in fact, we can check for that. We can check what's the distribution of the factor FM car values. And so you can see, well, let's do a jark barra test on that to check if it's normal. jark barra test, if the p-value is below 0.05, you should say it's probably not normal. The p-value is below 0.05, it is probably not normal. So you can say, I don't even think this distribution is normal. Uh, so you can't even put a confidence interval on it uh, accurately, right? The standard deviation that you compute that defines the confidence interval is not going to be right. So this is just an example of like, you're trying to predict future exposure to these factors. 
you can't because not even the distribution of exposure risk is normal, right? It, it's, it's not something you can model right. Now, of course, you can go back in, you can start saying, what distribution is it? Is it modeled well by a Garch model? Is it an exponential distribution? Is it a T distribution? Once you find a model that like understands what's happening in this distribution and can explain these spikes, and my guess is that this is, there's a lot of autocorrelation in this risk, once you find a model for that, uh, you can actually start making future predictions. But people in finance love arch models, garch models, because they account for autocorrelation and volatility. Um, so my recommendation in a case like this would be you try to fit an, a garch or arch model to this risk, right? Because the risk is volatility, and finance risk is volatility. So you try to predict, fit an arch model to this risk to predict future risk. And an arch model is going to take into account the fact that it's autocorrelated and it's going to be spiky like this. And then your future predictions, at least you'd know like what magnitude of risk you could be getting into um, with more accuracy than you assume than if you assume it's normally distributed. But this is just a good example of why you cannot blindly put a uh, standard deviation on something and assume that that standard deviation means anything. Um, the other thing you can do here is uh, you can construct these factor and tracking portfolios. And factor and tracking portfolios are basically just portfolios you can construct that perfectly track the returns of a factor. So like for this, let's say the, the book to price factor, you might say, hmm, I am weirdly exposed to this book to price factor. So I want to take out a little bit of a hedge on it just to like hedge me out of these cases to make these spikes not quite so high. Now this means I'm going to get a consistent um, negative exposure in all these other cases, but maybe I'm okay with that, okay? Uh, maybe I just don't ever want to be above, say, an exposure of 0.3. And that's like, I can avoid that. So um, what you can do is you can construct a portfolio of assets that tracks that factor. And I'm not going to go too much into this example. There's just an example here that tells you to do that. And then you can short all those assets and you can basically control your exposure to that factor. So that's just a, a, something you can do with, with the risk management. Uh, models. The the other thing I just want to say is that there's, again, there's kind of two approaches here, which is once you understand your exposure to factors, you can do two things, which is you can um, you can decide never to get into the kind of exposure in the first place. So a professional fund will have a layer of risk management. And what that means is that anytime an order comes out of the fund, the fund's models, uh, it goes to risk management first. And the risk management looks at exposures and it says, will this order, put my portfolio into a position where it is exposed to these things that I have historically decided I don't want to be exposed to. So you have these exposure requirements that you have that are been predefined. You look at the new portfolio that would result if you, if you made this trade, and you say, does this put me into a red zone in terms of exposure? If it does, I don't make the trade. I send back a warning to whatever system tried to make the trade. So that's risk management. The other approach is, let's, let's say that you know, you're already in a position where you're exposed, or maybe you can't easily like make make a trade or not make a trade, right? Maybe you're just running like a 10 pair strategy and you cannot like decide for one of those pairs that you're gonna make a trade or not make a trade. Uh, in that case, you might wanna hedge yourself. So what you can do is, let's say that you're overexposed to a sector, you can short a sector ETF, right? Again, it's just about knowing where your exposures are coming from and then deciding what you want to do based on that. So a, a lot of good algorithms, if they're not like long short equity, which already has automatic kind of hedging built into that model, um, a lot of good algorithms will have risk exposure built into the algorithm where they'll be checking their own, the algorithm will be checking its own returns, seeing if it's overexposed to any one of a, you know, maybe like 20 factors that you put into the algorithm and then saying like, you know, do I still want to keep trading today given my exposure to small cap stocks just went up a bajillion points, right? So it's just about adding more sophistication, uh, uh, being more aware of what's going on in your algorithm. Okay, so that's the final notebook. Uh, I don't actually have an algorithm for you guys today, um, partially because uh, David Edwards is back in school, which is sad. Um, but I don't have an algorithm for you guys today. And uh, what I can do is I can answer a couple questions that came up here. So uh, the first question um, was asking about um, active risk and standard deviations. And um, Amber, if you could just clarify that a little bit. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by sources. Um, so maybe if you could just clarify that question a bit, I can get you a good answer. And then the next question, which I'll answer while I'm waiting for a clarification, is... Uh, 
the question is asking about ranking for long short equity strategies. Sure, good question. So um, again, I'm going to do a full lecture on long short equity strategies uh, in the near future. Um, but the general idea is, uh, let's say that you had some fundamental factors, um, like let's say that your fundamental factors are, uh, I don't know, you can pick ones, pick ones that you like, right? Um, company name could be one of them. Like how many, how many letters are in the company name could be a factor, doesn't matter. Point is you pick these factors and then you um, make this model where you say the returns of an asset are equal to these, you know, these factors uh, combined. And then what you can do is you can basically uh, rank all of the, predict future returns for each asset. And the way you do that is you look at historical returns, you estimate the betas for all your factors, how exposed is each asset to um, each, each fundamental factor. And then given the current value of each fundamental factor, say, okay, well then in a month from now, what do I expect the returns of this asset to be? And you repeat that process for every single um, every single asset in in the stock market, and then you get this ranking, right? Um, and then you can use the ranking to do the the long short baskets for a long short equity strategy. But in terms of what kinds of variables, that's really the secret sauce, and like there's no answer to that. And every fund has a different style, and some people like profess that these variables are the right ones, and some people profess that these variables are the wrong ones. And so it's, again, it's up to you. I think uh, some easy examples um, are just looking at, you know, kind of common, if, if you look up fundamental factor model or if you look up value modeling, that's, uh, those are kind of common factor models that people look at. And those kind of give you an idea of what's going on. Um, things like uh, dividend yield, um, PE ratio, those kind of factors are things that people use. And so uh, a good way to do it is if you just like um, look at what new interesting academic papers are coming out in factor modeling and then look at what factors they're using and then see maybe if you could create a ranking system based on those factors. I think that's often a, a good way to a good way to do things. Um, OK, so in response as a clarification, didn't know how active risk was defined. OK, so I th I think as I understand it that your question got answered over the course of the webinar and that you are no longer confused. Uh, if that's not the case, please let me know later, either with an email or by posting on the forums or sending it by a carrier pigeon. Okay, excellent, thanks. Okay, so uh, that's all I have for you guys today and it's running up on just about an hour. So again, um, everything that you saw today is gonna be available permanently on the www.com slash www.contopian.com slash lectures page. It has all the lectures. Um, and uh, please check it out. Give me feedback. Figure out what's going on there. I'm, I'm very open to, uh, to feedback on all of the lectures because uh, I really want them to be high quality. Um, I have one more question, but obviously like feel free to leave now because we're running up on the hour. I'll answer the question and then I will um, head out. Uh, so let's see here. So the question is saying, um, yes, 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 that's absolutely true. So, uh, uh, you know, un, uh, basically the question is saying, well, if you develop a ranking system based on some factors, won't you be exposed to those factors? And the answer is yes, by definition, you are exposing yourself to those factors. The, the, the important point though is that that's intentional exposure because you think that those factors combined in this way are going to be good. You know, they're gonna be predictive of good returns. Um, the point with risk analysis is you wanna watch out for ex inadvertent exposure to factors. And this happens a lot where like you'll be designing a strategy and then you'll, you'll let it trade and then you'll be like, wait a minute, why does this strategy have high exposure to oil prices in Zimbabwe? And then maybe it turns out that there's some weird weird underpinning economic thing that's going on there that's causing the positions that you're taking to have high exposure to that. 
And then you want to look at like, why, why is this true? Can I avoid it? Do I want to take out a hedge? That kind of stuff. So that's what risk analysis does. But yes, um, risk analysis just says you are exposed to these factors and then lets you decide whether that's okay. And obviously, uh, some factors are, are fine to be exposed to and some factors are not. And the market is just a common factor that really a lot of people agree you probably don't want to be exposed to. Okay, so with that, I am going to end this webinar. Again, I am always available for questions uh, through uh, the forums or email uh, or any method you might want. On the forums, just post. Um, if you uh, say anything about like the lecture series, I'll probably hear about it. Um, and also my email is delaney at quantopian.com and you can shoot me any questions you had about the lectures. So thanks for coming everybody. Um, hopefully this was somewhat informative. We're going to try to keep doing these and I will see you guys later.